This harmless looking little wiring loom with a circuit board and piece of heat shrink is very, very naughty indeed. You see, it shaves mileage off a vehicle. It goes in line with the wiring loom and interrupts the CAN bus, the local area sort of network that communicates between the engine control unit and the dashboard. And it intercepts the mileage data or the kilometer ridge data and it shaves a bit off. And in this case, it was sent by a mechanic called Dave who said, I removed the device today from a 2015 Mercedes E-Class, which had come to me for multiple warning lights in the dash. My diagnosis found this small circuit connected between the instrument cluster and wiring harness, disrupting this can lines and shaving 40,000 kilometres, which is about 25,000 miles, off the displayed mileage. And you can imagine that that would affect the value of the vehicle greatly, you know, shaving that mileage down would mean you could sell it for a much higher price, and that's probably how this has ended up in that vehicle. So I've already slipped the heat shrink off to reveal the circuit board and I have to say there's not an awful lot on it. So let's uh, take a closer look at this. First of all, let's take a closer look at the actual wiring because there are so many clues as to the pedigree of this. For a start, it's using DuPont style connectors and interestingly, this one, instead of using an actual plug, they've used a DuPont twin row socket. And if I grab hold of this connector here, it is literally just a pin header that they've put into a socket and it's converted that socket into a plug. That's reasonable enough. It's probably easier to do it that way. They could have also used the, the standard DuPont style pin system, but this is really solid, so I can guess that's why they did that. That then loops through to the, the matching socket. And most of the connections are just coupled right through all the sort of, well, I'm guessing control signals. I'm not really sure what's in there. I, I don't think, it, it's certainly it's got the power connections, it's got the data connections, but it has also uh, physical control lines. I'm not really sure what that actually breaks out in the dashboard itself. However, the important bits here are that it takes the power, it takes presumably 12 volts, and it loops up to this board uh, and then loops the 12, steals that power and then loops the 12 volt back to the other connector. It also takes the canvas network uh, and loops it in. And looking on this board, and I'll show you this in a moment because I'll give you a close-up of the board, it's got a canvas receiver chip. Actually, I say canvas, it's a canvas driver chip because it can receive and send data. And that's processed by this microcontroller. And then it's then, the data is sent out in its massaged form via, via this pair of lines that go to the actual uh, vehicle, it's the instrument cluster itself. So if I just uh, bring in a bit, bring in a notepad here, let's uh, do that and I'll show you what canvas is. In the early days of automotive, everything used to be, let's tame this down just a little bit, everything used to have a wire. So, you know, every sensor, every switch, every light had a wire. And as vehicles get more complicated, they decided that they had to s slim down the amount of wiring and save copper and ease of manufacturing. So if you have, say, for instance, we'll just actually look at the engine control unit, the ECU, and the uh, instrument cluster, let's call it the dashboard, dashboard. But the instrument cluster on the dashboard, it means that technically speaking, instead of having to have loads and loads of wires there, all they theoretically need is a couple of power wires and the canvas network, which is a couple more, and that allows bi-directional communication between the two. And if you look at canvas, it's got uh, two lines, and if this is the plus five volt rail, and this is zero volts, it's got a high line and a low line. And normally, in the relaxed state, they're just at a sort of mid-voltage position, roughly about half the uh, high voltage, so I'd say about 2.5 volts. And that's what they call the recessive state. It's the rest state of it when nothing's particularly active. And there are resistors across each end of this to actually sort of keep them stable and avoid external interference. But when any device, and that could be the ECU or it could be the instrument cluster in the dashboard here, when it wants to communicate, it can actually take control over those lines and it can pull the high line up towards the 5 volts and the low line down towards the 0 volts. 
And that is interpreted by anything else in that network as a change of state. That goes from being the recessive state, which is actually a one, a logic one, to the active state, the dominant state, which is a zero. I'm not sure why they have the polarity that way around. And the idea is that because you've got this is this network is designed to connect lots and lots of devices. So in a typical car network, you'll have loads of devices just looped along this network. And each of them can actually, at any time, it can send a signal, it can get attention. If it sees there's no activity on the line, it can say, right, my turn. And it can assert its authority over that. It can send a signal, identify itself, and then communicate backwards and forwards with the engine control unit. So what they're doing here is they've broken those lines. And they've massaged them through a bit of secret sass and then sent them on their merry way. So that when the dashboard, now I'm not sure what, I'm not sure if the ECU sends the information and says, hey dashboard, here's the mileage and it sends it from its uh, storage in there to the dashboard. Or does the dashboard actually communicate and say, please send me this following data? It could be either way. It, dip, it could even depend on the manufacture of the car, which happens. But let's say the dashboard says, I would like that data. It sends it, it gets intercepted by that unit. Uh, the EC, it forwards it on. The ECU then provides the required data. This processes it, removes those 40,000 kilometers, and then forwards it back onto the dashboard. And as such, with this in place, it'll always show 40,000 uh, kilometers less or 25,000 miles less. Very, very interesting. Let's take a look at the circuit boards. It's worth noting when I pulled this out that it did have a sticker on it to show it was quality assurance pass. That's nice to know because if you're getting illegal electronics, you want to make sure that they are made to good standards. I did remove that sticker. Let's uh, bring in the second drawing that I should have just actually taken one picture. But um, actually, this one's useful because it shows the colours. Let's take a look at the... Is this going to be bright enough? I shall brighten it up just a wee tad. So... The two negative connections, the two zero volt rails, are just bridged together on the tracks. The two positives are also bridged together and they go to a diode for polarity protection. That's a sign of good quality. And then it goes to capacitor, uh, which is uh, the zero volts is going through under here to the other side of that capacitor. And then there's a five volt regulator. So we've got a five volt regulator here. I should actually, yeah, I'll just keep doing it in this one. No, I won't. I'll swap to the other side because I. Uh, uh, I'm not very organised, am I? Before I do that, I'll say this pair here, purple and green, is going to one canvas chip, and yellow and blue are going to the other. So this is the connecting, this is the, from the ECU, and this is going to the dash, the instrument cluster. Right, okay. This picture here is slightly bigger. I should actually not have even started on that. Not to worry, I've done it. I've started, so I'll finish. So there's the negatives, there's the positives. That's the, uh, that was the ECU data, and that was the dash. So we've got the two, uh, we've got the voltage regulator, regulator here that puts out the five volts, and that then goes to this ND or ODN. I'm not really sure which way around that is, but that is a 3.3 volt regulator. So that's providing the signals to that. It's providing the power to the processor. And look at this. You know, it's got it's got all the smoothing and suppression capacitors. It's quite well designed. Uh, the processor itself is an ARM STM 32F105, and. I reckon there's a very good chance this has been developed on an Arduino. Now, it's not using many of the pins. It doesn't really matter. All they wanted was this pair of pins here and this pair of pins here are the most important. In fact, there's virtually nothing. I mean, we've got, we've got programming pins going on to it here for diagnostics. Possibly a, a reset circuit here with a resistor and capacitor. We've got a 25 megahertz resonator or crystal, which has got a, oh look, it's got a uh, one mega ohm resistor across it. And then it's got little decoupling capacitors or loading capacitors at the side. It's all very textbook, isn't it? Oh, it's also got uh, some of the, the more experts in car numbers. Uh, it's got options. In this case, it's got W166. I'm not sure what that actually stands for, but that is the one that's bridged out with a link here. They've 
put a link or blob of soldier over it. It also does S for W222 and it does BMW. Is it just a generic? Is it one size fits all for the BMW? I suppose that would make sense. Going over to here. So let, let's say that this is all power supply up here. Uh, going over to here, we've got the two canvas chips. These are the driver chips. And on the output, you can see uh, 121, that's 1, 2, and 1, 0. That's the 120 ohm resistor. Typically on canvas, you'll have 120 ohms at the at the chip itself, at one end of the network, and then at the other end, you'll also have a, a, a 120 ohm resistor. I'm guessing the reason that they've got this here, which is a little solderable blob, is that on a network, you typically just have a resistor at each end. So if you've got multiple nodes along that network, they will not have a resistor. It'll only be at the main unit, like the ECU and the final destination, which in this case, this, I guess, was the final destination of that canvas network. There may have been other items along it. What else is there? Very little. A local um, decoupling capacitor across the power rails of these, the output with the 120 ohm resistor, termination resistor, and the processor with, as I say, just the power pins, the clock, programming reset, and the canvas connections. Now, what I was saying about there about the canvas, let me just grab the data sheet for that chip. Data sheet. The data sheet for the chip uh, shows it's absolutely blisteringly powerful processor. But the most important bit in here is it says two times CAN interfaces with 512 bytes of dedicated SRAM. So that's basically what those are. These are the two bits they wanted, the canvas interfaces with their own dedicated memory. So you can set them up as peripherals inside this chip. And I'd guess that they're just using that memory as a buffer. There's a very good possibility that at power up, this unit might pretend it's the dashboard and it may actually just send to the information that send a request to the ECU for all the information it requires and then just hold it in here and then pass it on as required after processing it. The chips are MCP2551, so they are just the standard canvas chips. They've got the two power rails, they've got transmit data and receive data from the uh, processor, and then they've got the CAN high and CAN low. Ignore the VREF and RS, these are just options. They're uh, output reference voltage, and there's a slope control, which I'm not sure where that would be used. It might be used in specialist networks that are running at very high speed or a particular length. Another option would have been a popular... Arduino -y canvas. If you've seen the Arduino modules, you may have come across the, the little canvas module, tiny little thing, which has 3.3 volts ground um, and it's got the can high, can low, and the transmit and receive pins. It's only got six pins, but it's using the Texas Instruments chip, which has the exact same pinout. It's very, very standard, and presumably by just swapping them in, they would work in the same situation. So there we have it. The, the secret sauce is in here. If this was developed on Arduino, then there's a very good chance that, uh, well, it's certainly what I'd do if I'd done it, that they would program it on Arduino and then they'd take the chip out or just tap onto the uh, programming pins and they'd read it into a programmer and then just put a bare chip in its own, program it and set the lock bits. Because most of these microcontrollers do have the facility to lock them so that you can actually read the program out of them. And that's almost certainly what they've done. I mean, it's possible they haven't. I don't really have the facilities to read this chip set up right now. It would have been interesting, though. But I wonder if these pins here are for them to program it in situ, it could be they used just pogo pins down on that for providing it the power um, and the data and the reset. Yeah, interesting. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting device. I wonder who actually made it. Uh, on the back of the circuit board, the only clue is that it's got, well, I can lift this up so you can actually see it. So I could zoom down and then I could focus onto that. Oh, that did not focus onto that. It's, it's trying to focus, but it's not doing very well. Maybe it's because I'm zoomed down just a bit too much. Hold on, let's uh, bring it up closer like this and see if I can 
focus there. That is, it's just not working at all. Right, okay, let's just not do that then. What it does, it says, uh, can high low, can uh, two, can high low one, plus 12 volts and ground. But the only other information in the back is can gateway version two. 2800-072601 And a CAN gateway, it's got other functions. You can use it, uh, a little card like this, to act as an interface for programming engine management systems where the, OD, the OBD port isn't giving the full access. Uh, and you need a little bit of software in between to, to give the secret codes that uh, the professional equipment does, which I suppose you could get just by reading it with uh, something like a bus pirate that uh, just basically connects to a network and just monitors the traffic on it. Very interesting. I find stuff like this fascinating because there's a certain pleasure to be derived from designing stuff that is, is naughty. Uh, there's, you know, just the fact it is doing something terrible just makes it much more fun. And that is very good. Uh, I wonder how good it is in the sense that if Dave was saying that the vehicle was throwing up error codes, was it because of this or was it just because of other, other error codes that while he was investigating, he found this stuffed into the harness? And, and what did the owner of the car say when they got the car back and there was another 25,000 miles, another 40,000 kilometres in the clock? That would be an awkward run to explain. I wonder if they went back to the person that sold them the car and, uh, and raised an issue with that. I suppose you wouldn't really be able to prove at which point it had been added. But fascinating. De definitely in the category of interesting stuff just because of the nature of its function.